Hello everyone, as you join us, thanks for making the time to join us this evening. My name is Michael, I'm the events coordinator and publicist at Annie Bloom's Books in Multnomah Village. For those of you who aren't familiar with the store, we're uh, in a little neighborhood in Portland, Oregon. We've been around for 43 years as of last week and we are still going strong. We're open on weekdays from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and on weekends from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Our website is always open. You can shop there day and night at anniebloom's.com. We offer curbside pickup, in-store pickup, local delivery within three miles of the store and a couple of different shipping options. So you can go there right now to this link, which is the event link, and buy, um, buy both of these authors' books there. That sounds like a good idea. We have some great upcoming events. Uh, just a couple more before we take a little break for the holidays. On Tuesday, November 9th, we're hosting the launch of Portland author Rachel King. It's her debut novel, People Along the Sand. And uh, a week after that, on November 16th, Tuesday, Lewis and Clark College alum Joan Knuckles Wilson will be reading from her memoir, The Book of Timothy, A Sister's Pursuit. Tonight, we are delighted to be hosting Southwest Portland authors Edna Kovacs and April Henry. And in April are both available to sign books. So if you'd like to have your book signed or have a personalization request, please include a note about that in the comments section when you place your order online, or if you give us a call. Um, after the reading and conversation, there'll be a Q&A at the end. So feel free to type your questions in the chat and I can read them to the authors, or you can click on, click on the little uh, hand icon that's in the reactions menu at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and then I'll call on you to ask a question live. Let me tell you about Bella's Nocturne. That's Edna's book. In Bella's Nocturne, we encounter Bella, a delightful bear cub embarking on his first hibernation. Bella's adventures lead him to discover not only the meaningful significance of this annual ritual, he also acquires insights into himself as well as his rich ancestral heritage. Edna Kovacs was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. She's the author of three books on writing including the groundbreaking Writing Across Cultures, a handbook on writing poetry and lyrical prose, writing with multiple intelligences and in a place called Sanctuary. Her haiku chapbook mandalas won the Cicada Chapbook Award. An extraordinary teacher who has a gift for providing writers with new insights into their crafts, as well as new understanding of themselves. Edna has taught students of all ages throughout through the National Endowment for the Arts, Artists in Education programs. Oregon Council for the Humanities, Chautauqua and the Schools Program, Portland Public Schools, Young Audiences of Oregon, Community Centers, Special Education Projects, and in Elder Hostel Programs. She has had a full career of teaching in the Portland Public Schools and at Linfield College and currently facilitates community writing projects in Portland, Oregon. April's latest book of many, many books is called uh, is, uh, uh, The Eyes of the Forest. After a best-selling fantasy writer disappears, only his biggest fan believes he's in danger. Instead of rereading his books, she must venture into the real world to uncover the truth in this fast-paced mystery. Bridget is R.M. Halden's biggest fan. She and her mom sought refuge in Halden's epic fantasy series, Swords and Shadows, while her mom was losing her battle with cancer. When Bridget met Halden at one of his rare book signings, she impressed the author with her encyclopedic knowledge of the fantasy world he created. Bridget has been working for him ever since as he attempts to write the final book in his blockbuster Sword and Sorcery series. But Halden has gone missing and Bridget is the only person who seems concerned. Can Bridget piece together Halden's cryptic clues and save him before it's too late? Master mystery writer April Henry weaves another heart-stopping young adult thriller in the story that seamlessly blends suspense with an exploration of fan culture. April Henry is a New York Times bestselling author of many acclaimed mysteries for adults and young adults including the YA novels, Girl Stolen, The Girl I Used to Be, which was nominated for an Edgar Award, The Night She Disappeared, and Body in the Woods, and Blood Will Tell, books one and two in the Point Last Scene series. She lives around here in Oregon. Welcome Edna and April. I think Edna's up first. Hi everyone. So Bela's Nocturne is actually approved for uh, audiences of ages three to 103. And if you're a young audience member, please feel free to fall asleep during my evening bedtime story because that's really appropriate. Um, Bela's Nocturne is also a, a story about meditating and waking up. 
It also has other different layers to it as I am a Holocaust survivor with my family being of Hungarian ancestry and those who do not, did not escape Hungary uh, ended up in the extermination camps. So fortunately, Bela wakes up at the end. I will read you some selections here. Telling tales of olden days, tales of black and golden days, grandpa sat before the fire, grandma spun hour after hour. I wove slippers out of bark and listened as the day grew dark. One such tale to you I'll tell. Listen, children, listen well. Once within a cedar grove, my thoughts coincided with spiders weaving bobbing webs. I was merely an inquisitive cub, deftly exploring pathways to streams, languishing in the tranquil dance of diving bluebills. My mother would have to drag me by the ears to get me to nap. Now in lieu of lilies, a woeful frost pillows the landscape where goslings and ganders once gathered about, a mirage of laughter lingers. Moles burrow ever deeper as fog mittens the would-be places I would roam. Crushing the last homely leaves beneath my feet, I dream of wild strawberries and dynasties of sleep. For when at last the clock strikes winter, when I'm no longer feeling zippy or seaworthy, it will be time to light the samovar and partake in that ancient tradition we bears call hibernation. This will be my first hibernation. I have received, I am told, an unusual invitation to lodge this winter in a cave with my spiritual relatives who live yonder, just beyond the well. I'm told the mystic grandfather of our clan always spends his winters there. Thus, I journey many miles across fields of harvested wheat, knowing not what to expect, yet knowing that by now the bunnies leap elsewhere. In the sudden ghostly darkness, I embrace the trees with their empty boughs. Before long, thick flakes of snow shall fall, and I'll be settled in a warm cave, dreaming of trout and honey cakes. On the outskirts of the orchard, I spot the cottage of my Aunt Anna and Uncle Monty. I gather new strength as there are bears of all sizes and shapes to greet me, not to mention dogs, cats, beetles, and likewise squirrels. Hastening past the well, I remember my father's parting words. Winter needn't be a time of abandon or grief, and my mother's last embrace with the words, Dear Bela, do not be reluctant to crawl into your cave. Sleep pleasant dreams. Aunt Anna trotted up the path to meet me. There were handshakes, curtsies, bows, introductions to cousins, guests, plants, and pets. My aunt made honey with tea. A burly brown cub introduced himself as cousin Theodore. Hello, he said, I've heard all about you, which was interesting as I'd heard nothing of him. His sister, Tiger Lily, a molasses cub like myself, took the knapsack from my shoulders and proceeded to play jacks. Theodore continued, you've come just in time for the legendary ritual. A bear's feast is in store for us, but first we must have a nose around. For seeing as you are our special guest, you must select a sleeping changer, chamber which pleases you best. When you have found the room most suitable for meditation and rest, he added, tell this pal pal fellow here, pointing to a Hungarian Vizla, whose name was Oscar. Oscar let out a discordant bark and led us to an anteroom behind the kitchen pantry. 
Soon we were crawling through narrow passageways. It was a remarkable cave. Within it, a presence of light emanated. Each chamber was a work of art. Within each niche, tapestries of fossilized fish, black and luminous, clung to walls and sculpted ceilings with backbones of the primordial abyss. I had never slept in a locale such as this. I hoped it wouldn't be difficult. Truly, it was rugged, yet full of an aura of unspoken beauty. One could surely explore it fully while being snuggled in. I don't mind telling you, I couldn't decide upon a chamber prior to the time I was to unbutton myself and settle in. When at last I asked cousin Theodore where he was intending to spend his winter, he regarded my question in silence a long time before answering. You may choose a room by a mine if you like, because this cave is full of secretive lore. That is, if you feel like staying on. Boldly and bravely I spoke. It's my intention to spend the entire winter here. That is, if you don't mind. We discovered our rooms at once. Mine was carved with jade and pearly nautilus. His was a cavern hither to mine where lava had formed preposterous peaks. Oscar sensed it was time to return to the house at once. I held no preconceived notions, yet I knew by the twinkle in cousin Theodore's eyes that I had made a friend. By the time we'd climbed the narrow stairs back to the anteroom behind the kitchen pantry, I could hear voices in busy preparation for departure. Oscar led us to the porch where all were seated with their belongings. My heart rose when I saw them waving farewell to all the geese, the foxes, even the crows. Synchronously, all the bears rose and began to make their seasonal descent to the cave below. Some held instruments, lyres, drums, flutes. Others carried baskets of provisions, barley, oats, maize. Still others carried logs and twigs, kindling for firewood, chipping tools, blankets, and tea kettles. In a dash, I hurriedly recovered my own knapsack, in which my mother had packed a few conventional items, as well as some curious things, which seemed as if they'd make much more sense to me later on. Candles, a hand-woven blanket, bar of soap, slippers, my favorite pajamas, an old bear with a gentle smile took me by the hand. He whispered, I am unknown to you, youngest of cubs. I am from times past and times to come. I am your grandfather. At the passageway's end, we found ourselves at the center of the cave in a chamber I had not seen earlier, as it was revered as being sacred. All the talking stopped. The elderly bear took his place at the center of the chamber. At once I realized this was our famous elder. At his signal, everyone unloaded his or her paraphernalia and began to partake in the ancient custom of painting the walls of the cave with symbols of our existence. Mountains were painted, shapes of birds, tomorrow's sunrise, dusk and stars, lakes and hues of green and gray, wild heather, kinnikinnick, blue lupin, Indian paintbrush, noble fir and maidenhair fir, cedar trees, 
and thimble fight berries. A fire was lit around which those with instruments began to play. While cooks chopped and bakers baked breads, muffins, cookies, and rolls. Not one bear stood idle except for I, who in all innocence stood watching them all. By now, I was just beginning to understand the true meaning of winter. No date was set, but our supper began on the 7th of November and lasted for days. After four days of feasting, chanting, music making, and storytelling, many were eager to retire to their chambers and were seen no more. Others succumbed to just one more tale, one more dance before midnight, when almost all had excused themselves. Theodore and Tiger Lily informed me it was my turn to speak to the eldest, as I was their honored guest. Well, what could I say? First, I introduced myself as Cousin Bela from the forests of Bacone. Next, I humbly sang a song, which is by now centuries old. Were I a brook, I'd know no sorrow. Through hill and dale, I gently flow. I'd playfully hug the banks, bring forth new plants, quench the thirst of little birds. I, who until now lived free in a world, who daily sang my songs. For me, one room is made ready. All this pleases me not. It was better to live in the woods, tasting berries. Sweet birds, my companions, I was with you today. Even to the last I was among you. No, I shan't be with you in the lovely weather, nor ever sing with you in the early dawn. The eldest bear, who was my grandfather, let out a peaceful howl. You sung well, Bela. Now it is time for us to rest. Thank you, grandfather. Good night. But to cousin Theodore, I reproached, weren't we supposed to go roaming? All in good time, my cousin. First, we must see to it that Tiger Lily's made cozy. And then, adding in a gruff, that's supposed to be kept a secret between you and myself. Both Tiger Lily and Theodore escorted me to my cave. They prepared my bed and lit my cinnamon candle. I was eager to have a look around anxious to explore this castle underground. The last, I put on my pajamas and lay down. When I blew out the candle, I'm certain I stayed awake for hours waiting for cousin Theodore. But Theodore did not come. I must have run. I must have slept. For it was symbols that woke me and cousin Theodore's voice. Wake up, Bela, it's April. All the world is chattering but for you. My bed was warm, the fields a barley green. Jays were shrieking, a sun was shining, and in Oscar's smiling eyes, there were roses. Thank you. Uh, I guess, am I supposed to talk? Annie Bloom's sure. That was Thanks lovely. Okay, that was lovely. Um, I feel like uh, uh, my book's a mashup. This is definitely a mashup. Um, so my book is Eyes of the Forest. Let's see, am I the center screen, Michael? Looking good, looking good. Oh, okay. I, just, I can see I can see your face in the center of the screen and okay. I can see your book. All right. 
uh, Eyes of the Forest. It's kind of a mashup um, between uh, Misery and Game of Thrones. Uh, I started thinking, you know, George R. R. Martin is very, very late on his next book. And I thought, what if someone kidnapped him and chained him to a desk and eventually made it a treadmill desk? And on top of it, there was a typewriter with a note saying, uh, you finish your series or else. So um, in the course of writing the book, I actually met George R. R. Martin, and he's probably, it wouldn't probably surprise you to know that he is a person who really lives in his own head. When he talked about the characters from Game of Thrones, it was clear they were as real to him or even more real to him than the people that were around him. Um, uh, and in real life, I, in the book, I have him having a teenage researcher in real life. He has a couple in Sweden who keep track of all of his details. So if he wants to email them and say, when have I used heraldry with seven pointed stars, they will email him back within a day with the information. Um, so uh, I'll read a couple of short passages. Um, one is just from the very beginning of the book. It's from the writer's point of view. It's called uh, The Gun. Bob, the gun looked real. No orange tip, no obvious seams where molded plastic pieces had been glued together. Although who was Bob kidding? He could tell a dirk from a stiletto, but modern weapons were a mystery. Besides, the important thing about this gun was that it was pointed at his chest. The end of the barrel was just a few inches from his heart. Adrenaline jolted through him. Get in the trunk, the young man ordered. Bob raised his hands in a placating gesture. Please, Derek, I just shut up, Derek barked. I don't want to hear another word out of you. Understand? But the word hadn't even left Bob's mouth before the butt of the gun connected with his temple. Bob's last half-formed thought was that the gun certainly felt real. And so um, in the book, the character who has kidnapped him loves the world of sword and shadow so much that he tries almost to live in it. He he does a LARP that is based on it. LARP is live action role play. So for the book, I knew that he would either be a LARPer or maybe do something with the Society for Creative Anachronism. If you actually live in Multnomah Village, the um, Society for Creative Anachronism used to have like fights in the courtyard of the, in the basketball court a couple of times a month. And they would dress up in armor that they had made themselves and fight with these swords that were made out of rattan. So they hurt, but they couldn't kill you. But it was fascinating to watch them. And I also um, did a ton of research into LARPing. So here is a chapter from Derek's point of view when he's in the LARP called Out of Game. Rickert ran through the woods, his cross swords bouncing on his back. This was no longer Camp Tamawaka, a campground with a vaguely Native American sounding name. And he was no longer Derek Levinsky, a teenage boy mostly invisible to the world. Here in the mythical land of Cascadia, he was Richard Starsworn, leader of the Peasant Rebellion. Despite having a price on his head and nothing in his belly, he would not be swayed from his mission to procure the sacred feather. Whoever possessed it could call down the army of griffins from the sky. Cascadia was a world full of magic and betrayal, of brave fighters, cutthroat, rogues and majestic nobility. One nobility. One thing it was not, definitely not, was the world of swords and shadows. While Derek's dad had begun the LARP as a frank homage over the years, dozens of new plot twists and characters have been introduced. And after the intellectual property lawsuit nine years ago, all overlapping names had been changed. So the game was now called Miss of Cascadia and featured griffins instead of unicorns. If new players remarked on any remaining similarities, they were reminded to stay in character. If they continued to do so, OOG, out of game, everyone knew to deny, 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 just in case R.M. Haldon's publishers, lawyers, had once again hired spies. Even though Derek's character, Rowan, had been renamed Richard, the general outlines of the backstory remained the same. Derek had reread the books many times in an effort to understand his character, it was Mountains of the Moon that he revealed Rowan for the hero or perhaps anti-hero he had been all along. 
As Ricard drew closer to the clearing where he would meet Black Fox, the thief who had promised to sell him the sacred feather, he slowed his pace, slipping from shadow to shadow. Suddenly a woman shouted behind him, I call forth a web spell. The spell, represented by a small beanbag filled with bird seeds, slapped between his shoulder blades. By Ferdinand's beard, Ricard swore. He was currently without a resist spell to counteract the web spell. Now his arms and legs couldn't move. Lady Katerina appeared in his peripheral vision, then moved to stand in front of him. Her long brown plates were round in a coronet around her head. Her smile was cold. Her left hand was hidden under her black fur cloak. Well met, Richard. Why dost thou run through my forest without my leave? Mayhap you were looking for this? She revealed what she had hidden under her cloak, the sacred feather of the griffons. More players allied with Lady Katerina stepped from behind trees and bushes surrounding him. Most faces were familiar, a few not. Clearly he had been double-crossed by Black Fox. What kind of a man carries two swords and no shield? A woman said mockingly. She hoisted her own shield and menacingly waved her sword. The kind of man who falsely fancies himself a fighter, her compatriot sneered. And here he is stuck without even unsheathing a weapon. He's not real smart, is he? A third man said. Shattering illusion they were all working so hard to build. Derek had never seen him before. He wasn't an NPC, non-playing character because they were provided with good quality costumes. This guy's tunic was just a t-shirt turned inside out with the hems cut off and slit halfway down the center. The resulting V had been laced with one of the cut off pieces of fabric. It was basically the cheapest, fastest costume you could make. He was wearing it over black sweatpants. Around his wrist, he tied another piece of fabric, but it did little to disguise that underneath it was a Fitbit and on his feet were tennis shoes, tennis shoes, what had the logistics committee been thinking when they checked this guy in? Had they been too busy pretending that apple juice in the tavern was really liquor? The advent of the Swords and Shadows TV show had raised everyone's expectation of what proper garb should look like. It had also resulted in a plethora of Halloween costumes that weren't half bad. If you didn't mind polyester fur and plastic instead of metal. Halloween had only been two days ago. Yesterday, November 1st, was also known as LARPers Christmas because costumes went on clearance. So this new player character had no justification for his sorry excuse for garb. In contrast, Ricard was clad in black wool hose topped by a long sleeve black tunic. Over that was a sleeveless dark green surcoat. Topping them all was a ruby red mantle fastened at the shoulder with an ornate brooch. After watching tons of YouTube videos, he'd painstakingly sewn the tunic surcoat and mantle and designed this sigil on the mantle. The brooch had been a lucky find at a goodwill. On his feet were black leather slouch boots and a large lady size he picked up on sale last summer. Since he had no pockets, they weren't period. Ricard carried his belongings in a leather pouch strung, slung a lot over the belt around his surcoat. Now he felt probing fingers. They belonged to the new guy. Physically putting your hands all over a captive was another lawsuit waiting to happen. One of the other players cleared his throat. Beg pardon, Blackheart Doombringer, but thou should stay. I search you, and then Reekhart shall yield his items. Reekhart bit back another groan at the new player's name. The noun verbers who gave themselves last names like Giant Killer, Dream Seeker, and Shadow Walker were always the worst. But Blackheart Doombringer? Way to telegraph what kind of character you were playing. Blackheart reluctantly withdrew his hands. I thought he was paralyzed by that web thingy. Lady C Katerina sighed. Nay, not for a search. Ricard welcomed the distracting discussion about the rules because he knew something others did not. He had not come alone to this forest. With a cry, five people start, charged from the trees on the other side of the clearing. Well, three people, an elf and an ogre. Tonight, they had all joined Ricard in his quest. An epic battle began to rage around him. Someone freed Ricard with a dispel spell. He reached back, drew his two swords, and threw himself into battle. Each time he swung, he yelled two for the number of damage points a single blow from one of the swords would cause. Blackheart was fighting off the ogre. While normally Ricard wouldn't gang up on a player, he made an exception for Blackheart. But once he joined the fight, the ogre grunted and chased after a fleeing Lady Katerina. Ricard circled around Blackheart, who had only a dagger. Unless Blackheart possessed a special cell to increase its powers, a dagger could do just one point of damage. 
Richard fainted with his right hand and then swung with his left. Two, he shouted, lightly tapping Blackheart's shoulder. Even though his sword was basically just PVC pipe wrapped in foam, it was against the rules to use any force. Injury, injuries playing Miss of Cascadia were rare, mostly just sprained ankles from tripping in the woods. Blackheart did not grunt. He did not take a step back. He did not act as if anything had happened. He just rushed forward, swinging his dagger at Ricard's face, a forbidden target. He didn't even shout one. Ricard easily evaded the braid, then whirled his left sword over his head and lightly tapped the same spot he had earlier. The sword in his right hand touched the matching spot on the other shoulder, two and two. From the other man's sour expression, Ricard could tell he had just used up all his points. According to the rules, Blackheart was now unconscious and bleeding out. Grumbling, he dropped to his knees but went no further. Well, I guess I'm dead now. Then thou hast better look at, Ricard said through good teeth, nudging him with the dull point of his sword. So that might not sound like it, but a ton of research had to go into that. I um, did a lot of research into mid medieval life. I read all the books that George R. R. Martin said were his inspiration. I did a lot of reading about LARP. I watched a documentary about LARP and I, um, I, I uh, interviewed local LARPers here. Um, I was actually gonna go and be part of this weekend LARP camp, but then when they found out I was a writer, they were suspicious of me. So I was not allowed in. So I was forced to rely on my other resources. Um, in the book, the character is, uh, I like to do research. The character is, um, is fastened to a treadmill desk with leg irons. So I got a pair of leg irons and um, I used a cable to fasten them into my treadmill desk and I walked in them to make sure he wouldn't get like really bad cuts around his ankles. Mm -hmm. If you wear socks, they're not too bad. And then um, leg irons are just like handcuffs, only slightly bigger. And I was thinking, hey, maybe he could pick his leg irons. Maybe there's something on a typewriter you could snap off mm -hmm. and use to pick the leg irons. So um, like if you had a piece of metal and it would need to be, it would not need to be this long. I picked this off the street. I think it's um, maybe part of a windshield wiper, but it's about the perfect size for picking handcuffs or leg irons. So I was thinking maybe there's something on a typewriter. So I went to Pacific Typewriter, which is on Barber Boulevard and is a typewriter repair place. And I got the guy there, Don Reed, and I explained to him what I was doing. And we spent a lot of time looking at a typewriter and found there was a part that raises the ribbon up and down called the ribbon vibrator. And uh, if you had snapped that part off, he could have picked his way out of his leg irons. But then I kind of came to my senses and I realized that um, he is a person who knows everything about uh, medieval weapons, but he would have no idea how handcuffs or leg irons worked. And it wasn't actually realistic that he would figure out how to pick his way out of them. So. That's one area of research I did on that that I uh, didn't use, but I did go in um, after the book came out and I gave Don a copy of the book. So um, the and book could come also, in handy in your personal life now. Yeah, I, um, you know, anytime I see a movie now where some girls chained to a uh, radiator in an abandoned house, I'll just think you could get out of that. There is something on your person, you know, break your eyeglasses, the underwire in your mm. bra. Um, something on your belt, something on your shoes, you could, there's a million ways to get out of handcuffs there. They haven't changed since 1912. Um, the mechanism's really simple. They're mostly meant just to keep you um, kind of confined, but they're not, they're not meant to be something that you need a, a safe expert to crack or anything. And then the book for me is a lot about what it's like to be a writer, what it's like to be a reader fan culture. I have a book within a book, which I've always wanted to do. So the main character is writing a book and, and excerpts from that appear in the book. And he's not only writing one book, he's writing two. A bad one for the person who captured him and a good one for himself. And so I got to think about what, what makes bad writing. And it was really fun to write badly. And, and how, do you, uh, how do you write yourself? So those were some of the things that went into the book. Um, so that was kind of it for me. Um, people could start typing questions for either one of us in the chat. Um, uh, 
or raise your little hand and if you, then if you go to the reactions menu down there or you can just pop on screen there's so few of us here that uh so um sometimes you will want to know like um like how do you get to what are the things that you would recommend to somebody who wants to be a writer and i always think it's reading a lot and thinking about what you're reading if you don't like something why don't you like it don't do that if you like something, it's harder, but try to think about what is it that you loved and how can you steal that um, for your own thing. And then um, reading a lot, writing a lot, and then not giving up. I honestly don't think it's the, I don't think it's necessarily brilliant writers who get published. It is um, the people who don't give up who get published. So I don't know, Edna, what would you add to that? I think you're on mute, maybe. Yes, I, um, you know, as somebody who's taught all ages, you know, pre-K through Elder Hostel, I say everybody's a writer, and I love whenever I see you running, and I we, we bump into each other, we used to live each, across the street from one, mm -hmm. one another in Multnomah Village, but I love the fact that you shared your research, and I didn't explain that, that the research that went into my books of Hungarian folklore um, stemmed from my uh, father, who was one of eight businessmen who was invited to Hungary in the early 90s. Um, it is still a fascist country, but who brought back like cookbooks, um, books on peasant embroidery, books on Hungarian folk songs and instruments, um, Hungarian folk jewelry, uh, gypsy music, so on and so forth. That, just got my imagination going. And so when you get somebody in your neighborhood, you know, playing basketball and, and I know you do jujitsu and I see you there too. I see you everywhere. <laughs> but the fact that you do the research and you get really inspired by something that really speaks to your heart, your, your soul, it just, just gets you motivated to keep um, asking questions like, wow, this is really, this is really interesting. And then how can I explore this fully and, and get the backstory? And so your story about the, the story within a story is that the Hungarian Taltos in my book um, is the grandfather and he is akin to the Native American shaman. And so he appears in all the other subsequent stories that I am writing with mm. these Hungarian tales. And and I didn't explain that, but so there's a whole history behind it. And, and so you get all this, all these layers and depth. And as a writer, as the more you write, the more you seek more depth in your writing. Mm -hmm. And um, and so when you start out, you know, you might start out with like a limerick or a haiku or something like that, or just a descriptive story in school. And then if you really love writing or you really like to tell, tell stories out loud and, and your friends like to hear them, then you might just want to just start, you know, getting more serious. And, and like you said, you just don't, it's not every writer that gets published, every good, not every good writer gets published, but, you know, the best people who persevere will um, find a way to, to realize something that's that they'd mm -hmm. like to share with others. Yeah, I, you know, we you were talking about we we're talking about research. So right now, I am reading dog photography for dummies. I do not have a camera or a dog. You have a dog, possibly a camera, but I have a character who's going to be volunteering at an animal shelter, taking photos of the animals to make them look more attractive, so that they will be adopted. And so I don't really know very much about how to take pictures of dogs or what to think about. What's interesting to me is I've read probably three books on it now, and they each come at it from such different perspectives. Although I feel like this dog photography for dummies is probably been so far the best book. It has had the most detailed, the most in interesting information that I'm thinking about using for my book. Um, what are you researching right now? Well, I lived on an agricultural kibbutz in, um, during the Arab-Israeli War in 1973 um, to 74 when I was 20 years old. 
and my parents kept letters and I kept a journal. And so I also published poetry from that time, but continuing on with the Hungarian tales, I, um, I have just completed a book for my publisher about a frog that it's an environmentalist and it's the frog's galliard. And, um, and so he's saving, he's saving the grasshopper groom and the mosquito bride who are having a wedding from ongoing, as you know, we have all this development going on. So the trees are coming down and the roads are being built. And, and so this frog, it's a Hungarian frog and he meets the Taltos once again. And, and so I just completed that one. And within that one, I have some Hungarian recipes that I'm researching by trying them out. So well, that's a good research. Yeah, no <laughs> it's delicious. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and put your, if you have any questions, put them in the chat or you could go to that reaction thing. Um, Michael, are there any questions that you feel like customers always want to ask? Oh, that's a that's a good question from you that I'll have to think about for a second. <laughs> I'll that's put you on the one. spot. Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, People, I guess when I talk to kids, they always want to know how long does it take to write a book? Mm. And there's really, I don't know that there is a set answer. I've written books fast, like the fastest I ever wrote was nine weeks, but I cried the whole time. And then I've had other books that I've, picked up and set aside and it's taken a couple of years um I wouldn't recommend the nine weeks what's the fastest you've ever written a book in Edna seven months that was writing across cultures I had a grant with Blue Heron and I didn't really sleep because <laughs> I had to get permissions as well um, from That's all hard. these different publishers yeah so it was on a different level plateau of existence but it went through three publications and I just worked really hard afterwards. I had a lot of jobs um, all over the country with that. Uh -huh. so, yeah. A lot of times people don't realize that things do need permissions. Like if you use mu musical lyrics, mm -hmm. you usually can't use musical lyrics because the song is very short. So you can't use them without paying for them. And it's the very publisher. hard to track down who owns the rights mm -hmm. to the musical lyrics and then to find the lawyer and then um, like I paid uh, for my very first book, Circles of Confusion, I paid Eric Clapton almost $1,000 to use that have somebody sing Layla in the shower. And that was like so dumb. I should have just had the title and say, I don't, I don't know. I thought that I really needed all those words, but that was, uh, I should have gotten a private concert out of it or something. But, um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, so now I either make up songs or I will have people sing the lyrics wrong and it, it has to be it has to be enough popular of enough song that people can figure out what the lyrics are but um, I usually just don't use lyrics anymore because it's super hard I I um I paid for lyrics from Tom Petty and Jeff Lynn one time and uh, they always want to see um, where it's going to, they want copies of the book. They want to see where it's going to come. So they don't want the serial killer humming their song while they kill a baby or something. And then, um, and then the lawyer was like, she clearly just had no idea. She'd never been asked before. She know how much to charge. So I just said, how about 125, which I should have done with Eric Clapton, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No one had asked Tom Petty's lawyer before to use it. Song well, or... maybe there's different lawyers that rotate in and out. So. Oh, yeah, no, so. And she represented yeah. both Tom Petty and Jeff Lynn. They both had song credits for Learning to Fly. Oh, and for sure. that one, I think that was a good use for, because I've had the quote from Learning to Fly in the beginning of Learning to Fly. So, and sometimes people think that authors are in charge of whether the book gets made into a movie, but that's when you sell the rights to someone else and they try and make it into a movie and you don't, um, you don't have a lot of control over any of that. So uh, I have a couple of things right now that are under option, but in my experience, a lot of things get optioned, but very little gets made. Although now with the Netflix and stuff, there's starting to be more things, or maybe I just know more people that I'm like, oh yeah, I actually know that person and that's their series, so. Yeah, that's a great uh, venue for that. Uh, 
you know, books are so hard to condense into a really good 90 minute film, but if you have like exactly. a limited run series, it's just totally made for a book for, for Netflix. Yeah, it has six, six episodes or something. Mm -hmm. um, did you think of any good questions or should we um, answer or so what should we do? <laughs> oh, I have not come up with any, I'm sorry. Uh, I was going to ask you about the research and then you, and you went right into that. So I was, oh, okay. I was very impressed. Yeah, I mean, you know me, I, I love my research money. during yeah. the pandemic. I was trying to figure, I had a book that's coming out in May called Two Truths and a Lie. And I wanted a character to look like they were hanging. So I researched theatrical hangings right at the beginning of the pandemic. And so I talked to uh, theatrical hangings. They actually, um, they, uh, there's actually been people who died on stage while the audience thought it was so realistic because somebody tried to jury rig a hanging system and it didn't work. But with good theatrical hangings, they wear like a, almost like a climbing harness underneath their clothes. And then it, there's a cable in the rope that, and then there's a rope that's fastened with Velcro that goes around their neck, but it never actually supports any of their weight. So there's not really a way for them to ever like make a mistake and strangle. But the guy who um, was talking to me that was an expert in flying, he like took his Apple charging cord and he had a bottle of Hershey's chocolate syrup and he was showing me on FaceTime how to make that work. And uh, he actually went to his, his company does uh, flies things for like they've flown a truck over a stadium, they fly bullets in movies so that you can see the bullet and stuff. So oh, yeah. he said the bullets way harder than the truck over the stadium, but um, he actually had somebody make a thing for me and took pictures of it and sent them to me. And there's a stranger I found on the internet. <laughs> cool. Well, well, yeah, there are no further questions. I guess we can call in a night just a little bit early. Okay. Uh, wanted to let everyone know, I think it probably told you this event was being recorded when you came in and it's gonna go up on our YouTube channel probably by tomorrow morning. So if you have, if you know folks who weren't able to make it, let them know that they can go to our website. There's a link under the events for our YouTube channel or you can look that up. And that link is still in the chat where you can go and buy both authors' books and let us know if you want uh, signings or personalizations on those. We'll be happy to do that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Thanks April. It was great to see you both mm -hmm. and everyone here. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.